Our objective this evening is to look at the 39 books of the Old Testament and <coughs> seek to answer these two questions. When were these books written and who wrote them? Now, obviously, the ultimate answer to the second question is that God wrote them. But what we want to <coughs> concern ourselves with tonight, well, who were the men whom God chose to <coughs> write down his word? Because modern man does not believe that these are the words of God at all. Um, I shall use the phrase modern man quite a bit this evening as a shorthand. What I mean by it is the, the academics, the scholars, the textual critics who have poured over the words of the Bible, treating them as if they were ancient Near Eastern documents to be judged by men's rules for interpreting such documents. And they've come to some very different conclusions about the authorship of these 39 books to what is presented in the scriptures themselves. And the reason why we're focusing on this tonight is because those views are creeping into our community. We're seeing them in the writings of brethren, in articles on the internet and in magazines. And those views are not the view that we hold as a community as stated in our foundation paragraph of the Birmingham Amended Statement of Faith. Brother Peter in his first class started off by quoting this. There it is on the screen. The Bible is the only source of knowledge concerning God and these writings were wholly given by inspiration of God in the writers and they are without error. Now the interesting thing that we're going to find is if you take the modern view of the writing of the books of the Bible you find errors all over the place. Contradictions, one book against another. We shall see some of those as we proceed. But if you take the biblical view, all is harmony. Now, we don't have to go very far to look for the modern view. Um, just type dating the Bible into Google, have a look on Wikipedia, and you will find that the modern view is that the writing of the books of the Old Testament took place during five distinct periods of history. Uh, starting with what they call the monarchical period, the period when there were kings reigning over the nations of Judah and Israel. Now 586 BC, which is the end of that period, is the end of the kingdom of Judah, the last year of the reign of Zedekiah, the year of the taking of the temple in Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar. What about 745, their start date? Well, 745 is actually in the reign of Jotham, the grandfather of Hezekiah. And before we even look on the screen at which books of the Bible it is claimed were written during this period, just take on board the implications. No, no Old Testament book existed in its complete form before the reign of Jotham. There were source materials around, they claim, which might have been a hundred years older, maybe a bit more, but not much. So people like Joshua and the people in the time of the Judges had no written scriptures, <coughs> nothing to guide them. So it is believed and taught that during this monarchical period, most of the first two-thirds of the Psalms were written, the first half of Amos, the first 39 chapters of Isaiah, and we shall see how Isaiah is divided up as we go along. Hosea, Micah, Nahum, Zephaniah and Habakkuk. And then, in the reign of Josiah, part of Joshua, Judges, Samuel, Kings, and the middle section of Deuteronomy, chapters 5 to 26. Notice we've got no Genesis or Exodus, Leviticus or Numbers yet. So that's the monarchical period. Then we come to the period of the exile, when Israel were in Babylon. The core of Obadiah, how do you write the core of a prophecy that's only 21 verses long? But the core of Obadiah, I'm taking this from the article, um, Deuteronomy 1 to 4 and 29 to 30, the rest of Joshua, Judges, Samuel and Kings, the early version of Jeremiah, Ezekiel, at least that's in the right time period, and 2nd Isaiah. Wrote chapters 40 to 55. Then we've got the period after the exile when they came back under Joshua and Zerubbabel going down to the, the really the beginning of the time of the Greeks. Genesis to Numbers from various sources. Deuteronomy was revised 
and, and completed. Third Isaiah, chapters 56 to 66, later Jeremiah, obviously Haggai and Zechariah during this period, because that is when they prophesied. Although they've got Zechariah over a hundred year period, they have a second Zechariah who wrote the last chapters. Malachi, Chronicles, which they, they date to the Greek period, and the origins of Ezra and Nehemiah. Then we've got the Hellenistic period, period of the Greeks, 330 down to 164 BC, Book of Job, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Jonah, and the final third of Psalms. And finally, the, the period of the Maccabees, 164 BC down to 4 BC, which is the time of Herod the Great, and in those years they believed the books of Daniel and Esther were written. Now, let's just ask the basic question, why do they reach these conclusions? Well, it is because they do not believe that these books are a revelation from God. They were compiled and written by man only. And they absolutely do not believe in predictive prophecy. So if an event recorded in a book appears to be a prophecy, well, it must be history written after the event. So all books which speak of historical events must be dated after those events. Now, we believe the Bible is the word of God, and we believe prophecy is one of the great proofs of the Bible, together with archaeology and the way that all of the Bible fits together, and we shall see some of that tonight. So what we're going to do now is we're going to open our Bibles and we're going to work our way through the Old Testament, looking at the evidence that the Bible itself presents to us. What does God say? Now, you may remember that Brother Peter in the first talk um, took us to Galatians chapter 3 verse 8. We won't go there again, but Galatians 3 verse 8 says that the scripture, the writing, preached the gospel to Abraham saying, in thee shall all nations be blessed. So Abraham had Genesis 12 as a written scripture. Then he took us to Romans 4. <coughs> that Abraham's faith was imputed to him for righteousness. And the inspired apostle said it wasn't written for his sake alone. So it was written for Abraham's sake. Let's turn now to the letter of James and chapter 2, where James is writing about the sacrifice of Isaac. James chapter 2 and verse 21. James 2 verse 21. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled which saith, Abraham believed God and it was imputed to him for righteousness, which is, of course, Genesis 15, verse 6. Now, you can't fulfil a scripture that hasn't been written. So there's the clear teaching here that Genesis 15 existed as a written scripture before the offering of Isaac. And that implies prophets writing the scriptures. And if you search through the book of Genesis, well, there's a whole line of prophets if you compare Genesis 2 verse 24 with Matthew 9 verses 4 to 5, you will probably come to the conclusion that Adam was a prophet. Jesus in Luke 11 tells us that Abel was a prophet, although we don't have a word recorded that Abel spoke. We know that Enoch was a prophet and his prophecy is quoted in the epistle of Jude. Lamech, the father of Noah, named his son Noah prophetically. Abraham and Sarah were prophets, says Psalm 105. Isaac, Jacob and Joseph were all prophets. So there's a line of prophets all the way through the, the time span of Genesis. God never left himself without witness. But what about writing? Turn back to Genesis and chapter 5. Genesis chapter 5 and verse 1. Genesis 5 verse 1, this is the book of the generations of Adam. Now that's the normal Hebrew word for book. It occurs in Nahum chapter 1 verse 1, the book of the vision of Nahum the Elkishite. And, and even the modernist view has the prophecy of Nahum at about the right date. They have to because of the 
fall of the Egyptian city of Thebes, which is mentioned in Nahum. God created man very good. So where's the problem with Adam being able to write? And Adam would have been an eyewitness of all the events that are recorded before Genesis 5 verse 1, after his own creation, with the exception obviously of the creation of Eve when Adam was in a deep sleep. But all the rest of it Adam would have seen. And as we're going to see later, prophets recorded events, at the direction of God of course, which occurred in their own lifetimes. So I believe we have evidence there of a contemporary record, right back at the beginning. Turn now to Genesis chapter 10. Here we have the genealogies of the sons of Noah, particularly the genealogy of Ham, who begat Canaan. And it goes on to talk about the various tribes of the Canaanites. Verse 19 of Genesis 10, And the border of the Canaanites was from Sidon, as thou comest to Gera unto Gaza, as thou goest unto Sodom and Gomorrah, and Adma and Zeboam, even unto Larsa. Well, after Genesis 19, you couldn't go to Sodom and Gomorrah, because they'd been utterly destroyed by fire and brimstone from heaven. So Genesis 10 must have been written before the destruction of Sodom. Now, the critics have concluded that Genesis is the result, is the work of multiple authorship. And in this I agree with them. We've got this line of prophets there. The critics also believe that those documents written by various authors were then taken by an editor who put them together and added certain parts himself. And there is indeed evidence of this in Genesis. So turn to chapter 14. So we have in the opening verses of Genesis 14 the battle of the kings. And verse 3 says, all these were joined together in the vale of Sidim, which is the salt sea. And the revised version puts those words in brackets. And you get several more sets of brackets as you work your way down. Um, verse 6, the Horites in their Mount Seir unto El Paran, which is by the wilderness. Verse 7, En Mishpat, which is Kadesh. And in verse 8, the king of Bela, the same is Zoar. Brackets are there in the AV in this case. But the really interesting one is in Genesis chapter 50. Genesis chapter 50 tells us that the family of Jacob took his body into the land of Canaan to bury it in the cave of Machpelah. So this great company is journeying out of Egypt to Hebron. And of course the logical route they would take would be along the Mediterranean coast up through roughly what we call today the Gaza Strip, and to Hebron. So verse 10 of Genesis 50, They came to the threshing floor of Atad, brackets, which is beyond Jordan. And there they mourned with a great and very sore lamentation, and he made a mourning for his father seven days. And when the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, saw the mourning in the floor of Atad, they said, This is a grievous mourning to the Egyptians. Therefore the name of it was called Abel Mitzrayim, which is beyond Jordan. Now the Canaanites lived on the west side of the Jordan River, which is the logical way that the funeral procession went. So whoever added that bit, those two bits in brackets, was sitting on the east side of Jordan, I believe in the plains of Moab near Jericho. It's <coughs> Moses himself, bringing together the scriptures that had been recorded in the time of the patriarchs and making up under the direction of God the book of Genesis as we have it. Now, there's some evidence of that. Turn on in the book of, to the book of Exodus in chapter 16. Exodus chapter 16, they're only four weeks out of Egypt, they've not got to Sinai yet and, and the people are hungry and they're complaining and so God gives them the manna. And having sorted out the affair of the daily collection of the manna and the weekly cycle and everything, then verse 33 of Exodus 16, Moses said unto Aaron, Take a pot and put an omer full of manna therein, and lay it up before Yahweh to be kept for your generation. So Aaron's got to gather some manna, put it into this pot, which Hebrews tells us is a golden pot, and he's got to put it somewhere very special, before Yahweh. 
Verse 34. As Yahweh commanded Moses, so Aaron laid it up before the testimony to be kept. What's the testimony? Well, they haven't got to Sinai and received the tables of the testimony containing the Ten Commandments, but it is the same word. And later on in their history, when the faithful priest Jehoiada crowns the young King Joash, it says that they put the crown on his head and gave him the testimony. They did what they do at the cor coronation of kings and queens of England. There's a Bible. They put the word of God in the king's hand. And that's the word that's used here. So here we have a reference to scriptures which they have brought out of Egypt, which are at the very centre of their national life. <coughs> and if you wanted to put something in some very special holy place, you put it before the Bible. So they had their scriptures. Let's move on now to Moses. Critics used to say that Moses couldn't possibly have written the first five books of the Bible because Moses couldn't write. They don't say that anymore because they know that writing was common in the days of Abraham. Then they said, well, Moses couldn't have written these books because the idea is too advanced for his time. Well, that's been proved not to be the case as well. You see, they'll, they'll say anything but accept that, that Moses wrote. Now, if you do a word search on Moses in the entire Bible, you will find something like 21 passages in the Old Testament and 9 in the New, which refer to Moses' writing. <clears throat> We've not got time to look at all of them, and they're not all there on the screen, but let's just look at the highlighted ones. Um, we're almost in Exodus 17. Exodus 17 records the battle with Amalek which Joshua won because Moses stood on the mount with the rod of God lifted up in his hand. And verse 14 of Exodus 17, Yahweh said unto Moses, Write this for a memorial in a book, and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua, for I will utterly put out the remembrance of, Adam, of Amalek from under heaven. So there's the instruction by God to Moses, write all this down, record it and read it in the ears of Joshua. Now, the critics say that even the source documents for Exodus weren't written at this time. So, which is right? The critic or the Word of God? See, the critic's got a problem here, because the text says that God told Moses to write a book. Similarly, in Exodus 24, where Moses wrote all the words of the covenant, and Hebrews adds the detail that he sprinkled the book with the blood of the covenant. So Hebrews endorses the fact that Moses wrote. You may have noticed as we read Deuteronomy chapter 31, a number of references there to Moses writing. Deuteronomy 31 verse 9, And Moses wrote this law and delivered it unto the priests, the sons of Levi, which bear the ark of the covenant of Yahweh. Take the modern view, that's a lie. Moses didn't write it. The text says that he did. Um, verse 22. Moses therefore wrote this song the same day and taught it the children of Israel. Verse 24. And it came to pass when Moses made an end of writing the words of this law in a book until they were finished, that Moses commanded the Levites, which bear the ark of the covenant of Yahweh, saying, Take this book of the law and put it in the side of the ark of the covenant of Yahweh your God, that it may be there for a witness against them. So the testimony of the Old Testament is that the law was written by Moses, it was put there in the ark, and it was preserved by Israel. Come forward to the second book of Chronicles and chapter 25. And here's an incident in the time of King Amaziah. Now, King Amaziah dates before that monarchical period that the critics talk about that we saw earlier. He's before 745 BC. 2 um, Chronicles 25, verse 3. Now, it came to pass when the kingdom was established to him that he slew his servants that had killed the king his father. But he slew not their children, but did as it is written in the law of the book of Moses, where Yahweh commanded, saying, The fathers shall not die for the children, neither shall the children die for the fathers, but every man shall die in his own sin. 
So they had the law of the Book of Moses there, and that was their guidance in matters that they had to deal with. On now to the book of Nehemiah in chapter 8. They have built the wall in 52 days, and once the wall is completed, we read in Nehemiah chapter 8 verse 1, that all the people gathered themselves together as one man into the street just before the water gate, and they spake unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the Lord of Moses, which Yahweh had commanded to Israel. And Ezra brought the law before the congregation, both of men and women, and all that could hear with the understanding upon the first day of the seventh month. That's exactly what Deuteronomy 31, which we have read, commanded in verses 10 to 13, that in the Feast of Tabernacles they were to bring forth the law and read it in the ears of the whole congregation. Just take one from the New Testament, John chapter 5. I love this one because it deals two fatal blows to the critics in one verse. Uh, John chapter 5 and verse 45 for the context. And here are the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuseth you, even Moses, in whom you trust. For had ye believed Moses, ye would have believed me, for he wrote of me. So Jesus not only endorses Moses' writing, but that Moses wrote predictive prophecy about him. So there's the books of Moses. What happened after the death of Moses? Well, let's go back to the book of Joshua and chapter 1 and follow through the Old Testament historical record now and see what happened. Joshua chapter 1 and verse 7. God is speaking to Joshua. Joshua 1 verse 7. Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand nor to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then shalt thou make thy way prosperous, then shalt thou have good success. So Joshua had the book of the law in his hand, and he was to read it every day, and meditate, it, meditate upon it, in the night. What a, a good lesson for us. Joshua 18 now, they're in the land, they've started to divide it up among the tribes but it's not uh, progressed very rapidly. So men are sent out now to describe the rest of the land which hasn't been possessed. So Joshua 18 verse 8, and the men arose and went away and Joshua charged them that went to describe the land saying, Go and walk through the land and describe it and come again to me, that I may here cast lots for you before Yahweh in Shiloh. And the men went and passed through the land and described it by cities into seven parts in a book and came again to Joshua to the host at Shiloh. <coughs> so they wrote it all down. Joshua 24 now, end of Joshua's life and he's got all the people gathered together to give them his last exhortation. Joshua 24, verse 25. So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day and set them a statute and an ordinance in Shechem. And Joshua wrote these words in the book of the law of God and took a great stone and set it up there under an oak, the oak, which was by the sanctuary of Yahweh. So I see Joshua is adding to the record, the book of the law. He's continuing the record with the details of this covenant which he has made with the people. Move on now into the first book of Samuel in chapter 10. Israel have demanded a king. And God has acceded to this. Saying they haven't rejected Samuel, they've rejected him. But it's got to be done properly. 
First of Samuel chapter 10 and verse 25, and I'm going to read the margin of the revised version. First Samuel 10, 25. Then Samuel told the people the manner of the kingdom and wrote it in the book and laid it up before Yahweh. It's exactly the same process. The writing continues. Scroll is extended. Let's fast forward a bit now and go to 1 Chronicles 29. End of 1 Chronicles 29 we're told the final details of the reign of David. We want to track this through now, through the book of Chronicles. Books of Chronicles. So, the acts of David, the king, first and last, behold, they are written in the book of Samuel the seer, and in the book of Nathan the prophet, and in the book of Gad the seer. So there are three prophets there. Samuel obviously was involved in the early part of David's life, Nathan with the middle bit and Gad toward the end. And this record in Chronicles is saying that all those three prophets wrote books about David. On to 2 Chronicles 9 now, and the end of the reign of Solomon. 2 Chronicles 9.29 now the rest of the acts of Solomon, first and last, are they not written in the book of Nathan the prophet, and in the prophecy of Ahijah the Shilonite, and the visions of Iddo the seer against Jeroboam the son of Nebat? So yeah, Nathan's still writing, but we've now got Ahijah and Iddo also writing. Chapter 12 and verse 15, the end of the reign of Rehoboam. Now the acts of Rehoboam, first and last, are they not written in the book of Shemiah the prophet and Ido the seer concerning genealogies? So Ido is still there, he's continuing, but we also have Shemiah. Now go forward to chapter 16 and we find a change. Chapter 16 and verse 11, reign of Asa. And behold, the acts of Asa, first and last, lo, they are written in the book of the kings of Judah and Israel. So you see what's happening. We've got this succession of prophets writing about the kings. And I suggest, and I'm going to, I hope, demonstrate it to you in a minute, that somebody is then bringing those records together. And now there is appearing a book of the kings of Judah and Israel. So move forward to chapter 20 and verse 34. This is Jehoshaphat. And I'm going to read now the margin of the authorised version. Now the rest of the acts of Jehoshaphat, first and last, behold, they are written in the book of Jehu, the son of Hanani, which was made to ascend to the book of the kings of Israel. So Jehu wrote about the acts of Jehoshaphat. And I suggest someone in authority, someone with what we would call in the New Testament the gift of discerning of spirits said, this prophecy of Jehu is a, a genuine prophecy. This is the word of God. We will put it into the great scroll of the book of the kings of Judah and Israel. Now come to chapter 32 and the commentary about the reign of Hezekiah. And, and read this carefully. Good Bible study is based on careful Bible reading. 2 Chronicles 32, 32. Now the rest of the acts of Hezekiah and his goodness, behold, they are written in the vision of Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, in the book of the kings of Judah and Israel. There's no and in the text. So Isaiah wrote that section of the book of the kings of Judah and Israel concerning Hezekiah. And it was called the vision of Isaiah because they couldn't say turn to 2 Kings chapter 20, whatever. They didn't have chapters and verses. They had names for portions of scripture. And that section was called the vision of Isaiah the prophet. And 
later on we'll find that Jeremiah was the writer of part of the latter part of the second book of Kings. And if you take the trouble to look at the parallels, those sections of second Kings parallel sections of the historical part in the centre of Isaiah chapters 36 to 39 as do those sections in the second book of Kings parallel historical details in Jeremiah chapter 52. Now obviously there's not time to write all that down but if anyone wants a copy afterwards please come and ask. So there's the books of Samuel and Kings compiled historically over the years by prophets who lived at the times and wrote down the history of the kings under whose reign they lived. Now, what about second what about first and second chronicles? Well, let's go to second chronicles 36 and read the end of the book. Second chronicles 36:22 now in the first year of Cyrus king of Persia, that the word of Yahweh spoken by the mouth of Jeremiah might be accomplished, Yahweh stirred up the spirit of Cyrus king of Persia that he made a proclamation. Ezra chapter 1 verse 1. Now in the first year of Cyrus king of Persia, that the word of Yahweh by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, it's identical. The last two verses of Second Chronicles and the first three verses of Ezra. So pretty clear that Ezra completed the record of the Chronicles. Now, what was Ezra? Well, Ezra was a priest. And when we look at the language of Second Chronicles, that resonates. We've seen a number of references in First and Second Chronicles to prophets. To the prophets who wrote books about the kings, not so much about the doings of prophets. But if you do a word search on the word prophet, 29 occurrences in the books of Chronicles, but 95 in the books of Samuel and Kings, because that's all about Samuel the prophet, and Elijah the prophet, and Elisha the prophet, and Nathan the prophet, and others. Whereas by contrast, there's only three references to Levites in Samuel and Kings, and a hundred in the two books of Chronicles because the focus of Chronicles is Jerusalem and the temple and the priesthood and the Levitical service and the kings whose record are written large in Chronicles are those who love the temple and built it up Asa, Jehoshaphat, Hezekiah and Josiah it also helps to explain why in Chronicles there's no mention of the sin of David because David couldn't go to the priests and say, well, I've committed adultery and murder, what do I do? The priest's commandment would be to put him to death. So there's no good reason at all to suggest that these records were not written until long after the events. They are contemporary records written by prophets on the one hand and priestly prophets on the other hand who lived in the reign of the kings. Let's move on to the Psalms now, supposedly written during the monarchical and Hellenistic period. Um, one problem with that for modern man is that those Psalms on the screen, Psalms 2, 16, 32, 69, 95, 109 and 110, are all endorsed in the New Testament by Jesus and his apostles as being Psalms of David. And the ones that have got PP after them all contain predictive prophecy which is another problem for the critics who claim that these psalms were not written and collected until finally 200-ish BC not true David wrote psalms and David wrote about the Lord Jesus Christ so we've got to make our minds up who do we believe? the Lord Jesus Christ and his apostles or the views of modern man. Now, what about Isaiah? Well, the critics, as we have seen, let's just go back a step. When I was the sort of age of most of those who were sitting here on my left, the critics claimed there were two Isaiahs. Now they say there were three. So chapters 1 to 39, chapters 40 to 55, and chapters 55 to 66. 
If you do a word search on Isaiah, which is the Greek form of Isaiah, in the New Testament, you will find, and I have to say at least, because otherwise somebody will come along with another one, um, 22 occurrences of Isaiah in the New Testament, each of which is attached to a quotation from Isaiah's prophecy. So, Isaiah saith concerning him. It is written in the prophecy of Isaiah, so the sort of things that you find. And of those 22, 10 of them come from Isaiah 1 to 39, 9 of them from Isaiah 40 to 55, and 3 of them from Isaiah 56 to 66. I can't squeeze them all on the screen, you'd never be able to read them, but there's some samples. Just um, look at this one, Luke chapter 4, Jesus is in the synagogue of Nazareth, and there is handed to him the scroll of the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah, and when he'd found the place where it was written, he quotes from Isaiah 61, which wasn't written by Isaiah at all, according to the critics. But it was to Jesus. Um, there's a fascinating feel for a lot more Bible study, if you care to put your mind to it. Um, that slide is just part of a table that appears in the Isaiah special issue of the Testimony, um, 2014, highlighting words that occur in Isaiah 62 that only occur elsewhere in the prophecy of Isaiah and which occur in the early part of Isaiah. So the word burneth only occurs in two places, Isaiah 62 verse 1 and 9 verse 18. And if you have a look at the testimony you'll see some more passages. And that's just one chapter in Isaiah. It's a huge field of, of investigation there. If you look at the Jewish synagogue readings, you will find that um, they read 26 portions of Isaiah in the synagogue on the Sabbath. Eight of them from the first section, according to modern man, ten from the middle one, and eight from the final one. Except, of course, they never read Isaiah 53. But they call them all Isaiah in the synagogue reading table. And when they found the Dead Sea Scrolls, which was the most complete Old Testament scroll? It was the great scroll of Isaiah, and it was all one scroll. So, who's right? The New Testament, the Jews, the Dead Sea Scrolls on the one hand, or the critics who can't cope with predictive prophecy on the other. Now, maybe you've got on your shelf a Collins New Atlas of the Bible. Bible Atlas is a useful thing to have, obviously. You can work out distances between places and their relationship one to another. So Bible Atlas is a handy thing to have. But um, this one goes a lot further than that. It's a commentary on the Bible, and it's full of the ideas of the critics. You see, the prophecy of Daniel is a huge problem to the critics, because it's full of predictive prophecy. And the biggest problem area to them of all is the first 35 verses of chapter 11, which talk about the interaction between the king of the south and the king of the north. And it's obvious if you read history, what that was about and brother thomas in exposition of daniel from page 48 just lays out the text of daniel and the historical detail side by side and the critics can't cope with that so the collins new bible atlas will tell you that the book of daniel is what they call an apocalyptic book and the story goes like this um, there was a Jew in Jerusalem in 163 BC, a very, very precise date. And the Jews, the Maccabees, were fighting the Greeks. And he wanted to give his fellow Jews some encouragement. So he sat down and he wrote the book of Daniel. Um, it's a bit of a problem to the critics because some of it's in Chaldean and some of it's in Hebrew. Why should he use two languages? But anyway, he did. And once the ink had thoroughly dried, he rushed out into the streets of Jerusalem and said, Look what I've found. I've found this ancient scroll which was written by the prophet Daniel in Babylon 400 years ago, which foretells all the history of the Babylonian, Medo-Persian and Greek kingdoms and tells us that we're going to beat the Greeks. So battle on, fellow Jews, against the Greeks. He wrote this book 
and then pretended that it was 400 years old and was a prophecy. Now, there's a big Bible problem with that. Turn to the Gospel record of Mark and chapter 13. The Olivet Prophecy. Mark chapter 13 and verse 14. The words of the Lord Jesus Christ, who has given a whole sequence of events for the disciples to watch for, leading up to this climax. But when ye shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing where it ought not, let him that readeth understand, then let them that are in Judea flee to the mountains. Now the abomination of desolation is spoken of three times in the book of Daniel. The critics all say, oh, it was about Antiochus Epiphanes, who, who fulfilled it when he put a statue of Zeus in the temple and offered swine's blood on the altar. No, Jesus says, hasn't happened yet. Well, hadn't happened when he spoke these words. When ye shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. Well, that's okay, providing what you've got in front of you is an authorised version or a new King James or Young's Literal. If you've got a revised version or a revised standard version or a new English Bible or an ESV or an NIV, what you will read is this. But when ye shall see the abomination of desolation, standing where it ought not. Because you see, there were people around in the fourth century who didn't like predictive prophecy. And one of them cut those words out of the Gospel of Mark, spoken of by the prophet Daniel. And that manuscript survived and was discovered. And the compilers of the text from which the revised version and all the moderns have been translated said, ah, here's the original pure text without these words in it. All the others must be corruptions, it must be an addition. So all the modern versions are translated from a text which doesn't have spoken of by Daniel the prophet. Because the words are in Matthew's Gospel in every known text. So that just shows the inconsistency. So all of those details in Daniel chapter 11 about the king of the north and the king of the south are a prophecy, an amazingly accurate prophecy. Well, that's how I viewed it. Let me put forward to you a view which appeared in a book published by Christadelphia. The detail in these verses is too exact, too specific. These verses read like history written in the language of the prophecy. Prophecy was blown up by some imaginative commentator into a marvellous relevance to recent or current events. You say he swallowed the modernistic view. Oh, it was written after the event. It's history. It's not prophecy. Let's just finish up with the New Testament view of the Old Testament. The book of Genesis is quoted over 120 times in the New Testament. And I just want to show you the focus of the quotations. So 120 quotations in the New Testament from the book of Genesis. That's roughly two and a half quotations per chapter. First three chapters, there are 42 quotations. That's 14 quotations per chapter. Genesis 4 to 11, 34 quotations, that's 4.2 per chapter. The next section about the patriarchs, down to but not including Joseph, 1.5 quotations per chapter. And the final section about the life of Joseph, 0.8. You see how it tapers off. The main focus of the New Testament when it looks back to the book of Genesis, is those opening chapters of creation and the fall and the flood. After that, yes, it is quoted, but nothing like as frequently. <coughs> so there's our 39 books of the Old Testament. How many of them are quoted in the New? All of the ones in green 
I, I just love it if somebody say in discussion, well, actually, I've got one from the book of Esther. But all of the others are clearly quoted in the New Testament. And even more interesting, how many of those books did Jesus quote, taking as our base material the four Gospels and the book of Revelation, which is a message from him? And, and the answer is 26 of the 39 books in the Old Testament are quoted by our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of Man and the Son of God. But if we accept the view of modern man, we've got to reject all of that biblical evidence for the truth of the Old Testament. Modern man quite openly says in his writings, oh, Jesus got it wrong. Jesus made mistakes. Uh, Paul was just reflecting the view of his day. This isn't true at all. So did Jesus get it wrong? Did Paul make mistakes? Or is it actually modern man who has gone completely astray in his attempts to understand the Bible? We've all got to make a choice. Whom do we believe?